today is, okay, so what I wanted to do with you guys today is talk to you a little bit about what the F awards are through the National Institutes of Health or through NIH, as well as the K awards. And I actually review for both of these awards. And so what I wanted to do then was tell you a little bit about what the awards are and then go through it as if I'm reviewing a grant, what a reviewer specifically looks for. And so since I'm now on the phone and it's gonna be a little more challenging to be interactive, we'll do the best that we can. But you know, please email me with questions and everything as well as we'll probably do more of this and um, as I was looking through this, each one of the documents that you have to send in for these awards could actually be an entire one hour Tuesday topics or an entire session or lecture. So um, just wanted to give you more of an overview of this initial time and then we'll dive deeply, more deeply once you decide which type of funding mechanism you wanna go for and I'm here to help you. So, okay, with that, Darren, the next slide. So this just looks at um, kind of a color chart that indicates the different types of awards that are available through the National Institutes of Health. So those of you that are pre-doctoral students, you're eligible to apply for T32s. And we'll talk a little bit more about what a T32 looks like. If you're a postdoc, you're also eligible to apply for T32s um, and as well as F32s. And then if you are a more senior postdoc or are thinking about transitioning in your career, um, what you might also think about applying for are the K awards. And we'll talk briefly about the different types of K awards. The one K award that is the most difficult to actually obtain funding for is the K99ROO. We commonly refer to this as the kangaroo, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that specific mechanism. So next slide, please. So these are the different uh, pre-doctoral fellowship grants that you can apply for. There's the F30, the F31, there's the F32 for the postdocs, and then there's an F33 for a senior fellowship. There's also an F31 that is phenomenal if you qualify for diversity. And the reason I say that this is phenomenal is the same funding mechanism as the F31, but if you happen to qualify as a diversity student, you go into a different pile of money and um, we review them in the same study section, but they, re they are reviewed separately from all of the other F31s and there is more money allocated for that specific pool and typically there are fewer applications within that pool so it's a separate funding mechanism NIH has put a large amount of money into that pocket of, of diversity grant opportunities and so it's a really wonderful one to apply for if you actually happen to be eligible next slide please so there's um, a couple of different K awards uh, next is the K awards, they actually are provided um, to support senior postdoctoral fellows or faculty level candidates. Next click, Darren. The objective of these programs are to bring candidates to the point where they are eligible and able to conduct their own research independently. And so when you're writing one of these K awards, you have to continually think about how is this award going to actually make you eligible to become independent? That is a key focus that we look at when we're ever we're evaluating these specific grants. Next click, Darren. Um, the current NIH policies require that at the time of the awards, all applicants must be U.S. citizens, non-U.S. citizen nationals, or have been lawfully admitted for a permanent resident, except for the kangaroo. The kangaroo is different with respect to its quality or uh, criteria with respect to citizenship. All right, next slide, Darren. So these mentored K awards, they come in a whole bunch of different flavors. There's the K01, which is for a research doctorate. Um, this is primary for um, basically continuing on your research. And oftentimes when we see one of these awards come in, sometimes people are trying to do this just more of as an expansion of their postdoctoral fellowship. That doesn't fly. This needs to show us that this is gonna be research above and beyond and different than what you actually were able to accomplish in your postdoctoral training period. The K08 is also for health professional doctorates. And this is a sort of a phased in approach. And it's basically, again, trying to say that you are transitioning from your postdoc into a more independent faculty career. And you're gonna be doing a fair amount with translational research. 
And again, this is just a brief guideline as to what these different K awards are, and we're going to go more deeply into how you actually apply for them in a moment. Next slide, Darren. Next click. The K-23 is also for health professionals. Um, and this is specifically looking at those individuals who are actually going to be looking at in, uh, patients or subjects within their research. And Darren, the next click, this is the K99RRO or the kangaroo. So the reason this is, this, there's very little NIH funding for this. It's a really fantastic grant if you can get it. Super, super, super highly competitive. And what you do with this is that you have a two-year portion of this grant that is um, mentored so that you would say, okay, I'm going to be with my current mentor for two more years. But then the last three years of the kangaroo, actually you transition into a faculty position. They oftentimes ask you to actually have acknowledgement of a faculty position that you would like to transition into, that, and it needs to demonstrate the amount of salary support that you'll have. So it's a, a phenomenal opportunity. And if you ever get one of these, it's just like your ticket to gold. You you actually, your career is moving in the upward trajectory and it's absolutely amazing. So I've reviewed a lot for these. And so anybody who feels like this might be a, an application or a method that they would like to go for, come see me sooner rather than later. And we can really work through how to make certain that you have a really phenomenal application to apply to one of these. All right, Darren, next slide. So these, um, there are five key sections of the proposal. So when I'm given a proposal um, to review, these next five different areas are the areas that we actually provide a score to. We give a score of between one and nine, one being absolutely phenomenal, walks on water is the best thing ever, nine being, well, pretty much not so good. So oftentimes what's happened is that the study sections we used to clump our scores so that we had like nine, and typically at a study section, we'll review about 110 grants. And so oftentimes we would have maybe 80 of them with a score of two. That becomes hugely problematic because then when it goes forward for funding, NIH doesn't know whether this is a good two, a bad two, or whatever. So the push has been for the study sections and the reviewers to really spread their scores. So if ever you get a grant back and you have a score, come find me, and then what we can do is try to figure out within that study section, how does that score that you received on your grant, how does it calibrate against how that study section typically scores grants? For example, if you get a, a grant back and it has a score of four, that might be absolutely phenomenal for that study section. But for another study section, that might be the worst grant that ever. So you can't, don't get worried about the number until we put it into context as to how that specific study section typically evaluates grants. I hope that makes sense. Um, okay, so these are the five areas. We first review the candidate and the career development plan, and I'll talk more about this. Next, we also, um, Darren, hopefully you're following me. We um, next review the mentor's research plan and how it will facilitate your career. This is absolutely critical, and we're going to talk more about this as well. Next click, Darren. We also look at the institutional support, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. Next click, Darren. And the research plan, and then next click. This is really the area that we want you to show us why you, why now, why where you are, and why is the research that you're proposing important. This is, these, this is exactly what your grant needs to just scream. And I'll talk more about this in a minute. So go ahead, next slide. So these are the, the areas that we actually score. The first is the applicant. And so we give you a score as the applicant. And what we have on our, our scoring sheet, and again, when we do this more in detail, I'll be able to, to show you one of these, is a, where we list the strengths of you as an applicant as well as your weaknesses. And then we give you an overall score. The next area is your sponsor, the sponsor's collaborators, and different consultants. And we'll talk a lot this evening about how critical your sponsor, your mentor actually is to your overall application. Next click. We also look at your research training plan. However, we are not supposed to make the sole score of your grant based on your research training plan. It's supposed to be a, a totality of how you um, look as a total applicant, not only you yourself, your sponsor, also what you're planning to do, and how great the fit of the research is to your overall career objective. Next, we look at the training potential of the grant. 
And then lastly, we look at the institutional environment and the commitment to training. Next slide, Darren. So the project summary is the first thing that I look at whenever I uh, pick up a grant. And so next click, Darren, and you can probably can just go through all of the clicks on the slide. So this is basically for the project summary. It's your elevator pitch for your entire application. Make sure that it conforms to the font, the length, and the guidelines for the application. We are very crabby when we get a grant that either has the font that's the wrong size or they have way too many lines or it's all bolded or it's in five different colors. None of those comply to the requirements. You absolutely have to make certain that you comply to every, compl uh, every requirement in that project summary. Do not take a cut a corner and absolutely do not have a typo. It's a, it just is dead on arrival if it has a typo in your project summary. This is where you sell your idea. Use bolding and shading appropriately. I can't stand it when I, nor can a lot of people that review grants. If it's all bolded and highlighted and, and also um, all capitals and underlined, it, it, it just it screams at me and it's like, oh, it, it just doesn't fly. So make sure you use bolding and shading to make it attractive. Have your roommate, have your mom, have your dad, whoever, look at it just to make sure that it is um, actually aesthetically pleasing because it's really, really important. And this is just a reminder to you that typically when I step into a study section, I might have 10 to 15 grants and I have to score all of those and I haven't given a really short time frame to do it. That's why when I look at this project summary, the first thing I think about, oh, this is kind of a cool project or I, this absolutely it falls flat. If it falls flat and I think, oh, this isn't so great, I have to tell you that in my mindset then, I'm much more critical as I'm moving forward looking at the rest of your grant. But if I'm totally blown away by your idea, then all of a sudden I perk up, maybe grab a cup of coffee, and I'm ready to go, and I'm 100% I'm, I'm a champion for you um, throughout the rest of the grant. So this is why this project summary, which is the very first, it's a paragraph where you sell what you're going to do, is so incredibly important. Okay, next slide. The next thing that I look at are your facilities. And so, Darren, you can click all the way down through this as well. So, sorry about that. So, make sure that you have, that you list all of the necessary equipment and resources on your facility page. Don't think that all of a sudden we're not that smart on the study section and we'll figure out that maybe you needed to have access to a 3D printer and you know, don't list the fact that you have a 3D printer we will ding you horribly on the fact that you don't have the appropriate resources. So make certain that whatever you need for your project, you write down and you let us know that everything under the sun and more is available to you at Drexel University to make certain that you are successful in your project. And your mentor really needs to help you write this. I can also help you write this as well. Make sure that you list that you have space, you have an office, you have a touchdown space, you have the best computer known to man, you have internet access out the wazoo, you are just, you are ready to go um, as soon as you are given money to do this project because all of the resources, all of the facilities are there waiting on you. Um, I also have just sort of in italics at the bottom of this facilities page, the next thing I look at are the references when I'm looking at your grant. So the facilities page is one page, but the references is the next thing that comes in your application. Be savvy. If you know that your grant is going to go to a certain study section, make sure you know who's on that study section. It's public knowledge. For example, I, my expertise is sex hormones and how they influence metabolism. I can't tell you how many times people will send a grant into our study section that focuses on sex hormones and its influence on metabolism. And I look at the references and not that I'm bold or brass or anything, but if they've never cited my work and it's re directly related to what I do, that's kind of bad. And I'm not, I'm using myself as an example, but I can promise you that other reviewers are even worse on this. If you send a grant in and you know that somebody on that study section has the exact expertise that your grant has, make sure you at least reference them in your, in your, um, in, while you're writing the grant in the background section or somewhere. We pay attention. I suppose we have an ego, I don't know, but just make certain that you actually reference the people who are the experts in the area for which you're applying for your grant. Okay, next, next page. 
Um, so institutional support, this is especially true for the K awards. It's very vital, and Darren, you can just click all the way through this slide as well. Um, you need to uh, say that you are important to the research enterprise. Again, with the K awards, you're trying to say that you, that through this granting mechanism, you are going to become this powerful, amazing independent investigator, that only you have this skill set, only you can do this project, and only you can do this project at X institution. And so you really, really want to emphasize how you are a gorgeous fit to this institution and how that institution will benefit from you being there. And that's really what this sort of um, is trying to say with respect, and this is a little bit different for the Ks, but again, it's sort of as you're transitioning, think about what type of granting mechanism you're using. And if you're transitioning to become independent, you need to sell yourself about why you, why at that institution and what you're bringing to that institution. All right, next. Darren, this is the biosketch page, just to keep you where you are. So this is probably a small font, but hopefully you all can see it. If you do the first click, that is your personal statement. And so again, this is an entire course all unto itself, is how to write a good biosketch. But make sure that your personal statement is so important. So after I've looked to make sure you have the resources and that you have gotten, you've sold me on your idea, I now dive into your biosketch. And I want to know why you, why now, what is it about you that you that sells you as to why you're going to do this research project. Also, this is the place to explain away any inconsistencies, any blemishes, any blips, any gaps, anything. Because the next thing I'm going to look at is whether you've published, and then I'm going to look at your grades. And if you've got things hiding in there, like I'm going to use myself as an example, I went to my um, undergraduate and I wanted to become a marine biologist. And my very first marine biology course, I got a D. So now if I put that and I decided I'm gonna be a marine biologist, but I have a D in the basic courses that are pertinent to my career, you better explain away why you got that bad grade in that core and you do it right here. You could say you were a late bloomer, you are, um, you had diabetes. You, you tell us for some reason why all of a sudden a course that's in the major area of your study and your focus, why all of a sudden you didn't do very well. Okay, so you just, and you're just honest, you're, you're to, the, the personal statements that just draw at our emotional purse strings are the ones where you're telling us a story where your mom had diabetes and now all of a sudden you realize that you want to be a diabetes uh, educator and researcher or you went someplace and, and all of a sudden something happened to you and you became enlightened. It, it matters not what it is, but make this a compelling story. Tell us why it is you and why you want to do this research. It's so important and it happens right here in that personal statement. Darren, the next click. Um, you also tell us about any positions or honors you've had. I can, again, show you nine trillion grants in my office. People look like they walk on water, especially in this bio section. And so if you have honors or you've been awarded anything, flaunt it. Um, you are competing against other people who are flaunting like there's no tomorrow. So you've got to be out there selling yourself. So flaunt it as much as you possibly can. Note there's no too much flaunting. Next click. You also want to talk about your specific contributions to the type of science for which you're applying. So if you have publications, highlight it. If you have um, 10 million abstracts where you presented to XYZ meeting, but you don't have papers that you published after you've presented 10 million abstracts, low light it. Don't show us that. Only pick abstracts that are where you were the seminal speaker. What looks horrible to us is if you have 10 million abstracts and no publications. It means that you're a flash in the pan, you get up there, you give a great presentation, but you never have follow through. It is an absolute killer on an application. It matters not how fabulous the rest of the application is, this could act, this, that one area can actually be a no-go and we won't fund your application. So this is really, really, really important. Um, also, the other thing I caution about, if you list that you have 12 manuscripts in preparation or that you're working on and your grant gets reviewed and you need to revise it to come back, we have like probably photographic memory. So for example, you write up, you send us an application, you have five, uh, five manuscripts that are pending, 
we give you a score, we think your grant's great, you just need to brush up on some stuff, you reapply to us, it comes back. If we see those same five manuscripts that are pending, your grant's gone because it means that you didn't do anything with moving that scholarship forward. You have to make sure that if you reapply, that you've done something with those pending manuscripts. Either they were submitted in, in there in publication or they were submitted and rejected. You've got to tell us something, but don't just leave them still pending because we will remember. And it's amazing when it comes to study section, people really do remember. that. Oh, I reviewed this last time. Those same five manuscripts are still pending. Out your application goes. So it's just something to consider. Okay, the next one. Um, your scholastic performance. Make sure right now, I know you all, the students anyway, have an opportunity to do pass or fail. Don't do it because not every school is going to be doing that and you really want your grade. We want to see how fabulous your GPA is. So showcase it. Tell us what an amazing student you are. If you're a late bloomer and all of a sudden you found that school is amazing and you, you did that in graduate school and all of a sudden now you have a four point, tell us. Tell us that in, the, in that personal statement, but highlight how amazing after you found that nursing was the most important thing for you ever. Once you found it, then all of a sudden your grades went up exponentially. Tell us, we wanna know, because that really tells us that now you're, you're, you're studious, you're focused, you're loving life, and we know that you're gonna be an absolute excellent candidate. Next click. If you've had previous funding for any type of research, show us. If you don't, work on it now. Maybe your mentor can put you on some sort of grant application that they're applying for. Um, but if, you, if your field, for example, you came in as a nurse and as a practicing nurse, you didn't need to publish and you didn't need to have your names on grants. It's okay, but tell us that in your personal statement. Say, you know what, I, I was, for, for example, again, I'm using myself, I was a practicing dietitian. I didn't have publications. I didn't have grants. I was out seeing patients and doing weight loss programs. So in my personal statement for my very first grant, I said that was what was standard in my field, but now I'm transitioning into a new field, and now I know that the importance of scholarship and forevermore I'll be publishing. But just explain it to us, and we're very, very understanding if we, if we get an idea about why something's happening. Okay, next. Um, just this is about the optimal candidate. Um, we want to know why you're perfect for this specific application. It's a lot of competition out there. I'm not trying to scare you, but sometimes we don't sell ourselves strong enough. So just make sure that you tell us why you're the optimal candidate. And Darren, you can click all the way through here as well. Um, just make sure that you talk to us about um, everything that you've learned, why you're, why you're doing this, why this means something to you, how the manuscripts that you might have published in your past, have set you up to be the optimal candidate. Tell them that you're the, you're the best person ever to do this research. Just again, it's all about selling yourself, selling yourself, selling yourself. And, and it's, it, I have a cautionary tale in here. However, be humble at the same time. And that comes back to, you know, if all of a sudden you didn't do so well in a certain course, then tell us you're the perfect candidate and you know you didn't do very well in that course but through this research application, you're going to make sure that you take external courses in order to be able to beef up your knowledge in that area, or tell us something about how you're going to um, fix some of your deficits. Okay, next. Um, also talk to us about your presentations and your awards. Okay, so the mentor's bio sketch. The first thing I have here is the personal statement from the mentor. Now, believe it or not, we have seen, and I've seen more of this than I can even imagine, make sure that your mentor spells your name correctly. Oftentimes what we will find on the mentor's personal statement, it might not even be your name. As mentors, sometimes we're really pressed for time. Maybe we just copy a bio sketch over. We forget to put your name as the applicant in the personal statement. So all of a sudden we're reading this as a, a, a grant for me, and in the, my mentor's personal statement, it talks about John PQ or somebody. And all of a sudden we're like, wait a minute, this is mentor didn't even pay attention to make sure that the applicant's name is in the bio sketch or in the SMIC person's bio sketch. It's also because you're putting the application together, just make sure 
that your name is in that section and that it's spelled correctly. Okay, it seems silly, just but just make sure. Your mentor must talk about you in that and her, hers or his bio sketch. They've got to say something about why they are the perfect mentor for you with, with your name and that they're going to help you do X, Y, and Z and that they have the skill set in order to be able to train you to do whatever it is that you're going to do. So the next thing is the positions. Just make sure your mentor highlights their positions. And the next is their membership and awards, their contributions to science. I want to make sure that you've chosen a mentor who has published in the area for which they're going to be a mentor for you. For example, if you are, have a mentor and your project's all about genetics, and your mentor has never published a single paper on genetics, I have a disconnect. I have, a, I have something that you want to do, but your mentor is not an expert in that area. So we've got a problem. So make sure that your mentor has published within the areas that you are trying to excel in. If they haven't, make sure that you have someone else on your application who is an expert on that area so that you can show that there, is, there are people with credibility that can actually guide you in your research. The next one I can't emphasize enough is your mentor's research funding. Your mentor has to have research funding. And this is a problem right now with, at, N at NIH. Um, so many mentors, because it's so hard to get funding, a lot of mentors have gaps in their funding or they currently don't have funding. And unfortunately, your application is competing with someone else who has a mentor who has gobs of money. And so we have to, in the study section, we look at, oh my gosh, this person has got so much money. If, they, if the student needs some sort of resource, then all of a sudden they have them all, all those resources are available and that's a perfect fit because that person's gonna be able to go forward and do amazing research. If we're looking at an application where the mentor doesn't have any funding, it's really difficult to compete with another mentor who has tons of funding. What your mentor can do is they can tell you, us in this, in their bio sketch, okay, they've applied for 12 grants, they're all pending. That gives us some warm fuzzy. We think, okay, the mentor's out there trying to get some money. They've got bridge money. They've got money from the institution. They're doing something to show us that they are trying to fill in the gap for the fact that they don't have money. I cannot emphasize enough how critical this is. And those of you who might be on this um, listening to me who are mentors, this is so important. So if you don't have funding, make sure you have a collaborator who does have funding and that can really help. Well, then we'll say, okay, well, there is money within the institution that can help the science go forward. So it's really, really important. Okay, so next. The mentor should, and Darren, you can click all the way through this slide too. Again, I know I'm going to be tied on time, but just I uh, want to make sure that um, you just look at the mentors need to be well financed. They need to emphasize the, how their, their expertise in the area of science that needs to be covered within your application. Okay. Um, doctoral dissertation. This is the next section on, on, an, on an F or a K award. And basically, and Darren, you can click all the way through here, just, oops, because I went too fast on my own. Um, in this section, you tell us about who you are, what your training goals and research objectives are. Make certain that you are consistent throughout your entire application where you are stating what your training goals and research objectives are and make sure that your application, the science, the, the project that you're proposing to do fulfills your training goals. I can't tell you enough how many applications we get where they want to be a phenomenal teacher and there's absolutely nothing in the application in the whole entire proposal that will make you a great teacher. So make sure that your goals and objectives can be reached by you doing what's in this entire proposal. Or maybe you want to be a geneticist, but all of a sudden there's absolutely no genetics within your application. Again, you are mentor, you and your application need to be con entirely consistent throughout the, every single document that you have to put in this application. Also make sure that um, you are talking about the courses of responsible conduct, what courses you're going to take that will fill in your void. For example, if you identified that you had a knowledge gap in understanding, again, genetics, make sure that you tell us you're going to take a genetics course. Um, make sure that you tell us 
if you want to be a teacher, what type of formal teaching and mentorship opportunities are going to be available to you. Talk to us about your publication goals. Um, talk to us about how you vision where, where are you going to be in 10 years? Do you want to be an independent investigator? If so, then how are you going to get there and how will this application help you get there? And then also make sure that you give us a timeline within your, um, to tell us how you're going to achieve your project goals within the number of years you're applying for this grant. Darren, next slide. So the next um, critical area that we look at is the specific aims page. And so Darren, you can click all the way through this as well. So this is the time that now all of a sudden the science or your scholarship, it's now here to shine. The specific aims page, as you all probably know, it's one page. Absolutely no typos. You can't imagine how many we get. And as soon as a typo appears, all of a sudden when you're competing against somebody else who has a flawless, beautiful grant, that typo, even as minor as it is, it all of a sudden can take you from a score of a one to a four. So just make sure there's no typos. Make sure it's proper English as well. So have someone else read it. Make sure that there's no grammatical errors or that there's no punctuation errors, that it just is beautiful. Again, this is another time to use appropriate use of your fonts, your bolds, and your shading. I love it, and so do so many other people who are reviewing. If you can put in a diagram or a picture or something that captures how these aims are independent yet, but they still flow through to one overarching common theme, gorgeous. If you can totally do that, it, the specific aims page is, again, really something that needs to just be beautiful, something that I want to look at. And if you have a picture in there, it's amazing. Make sure that your aims are measurable and testable, but also make sure that this application is not overly ambitious. This is another killer, especially for someone who is in a training grant. You cannot propose you're going to do see 5,000 patients within one year and you're going to do all this in depth, whatever. No, you can't. You're, you're a student. You're, you're in your training phase of your career. Make sure that it is within a reasonable time frame and that you're not asking to overdo. Um, it happens so frequently. So, so just make sure that your mentor looks at that. I can look at it. Whoever can look at it. But let's make sure it's not overly ambitious. It's now okay. You can get away with just doing two specific games. You can do three. You probably, for a training grant, don't want to do four. That looks pretty overly ambitious. But two or three is perfectly fine. And at the end of the specific aims, aims page, say why you, why now, and why wow. Why is this like the most important thing ever to be done right now and by you? And you leave me with that like little teaser, and I'm like, ah, oh, this is awesome. And I might not even look at in great detail the rest of your science or the rest of your project. If I'm sold on your specific aims page, so incredibly sold, I might say, okay, this is awesome, and I might just flip through it because now I've got, I'll move on to the next grant because I've already given you a phenomenal score. So that's why this is so incredibly important. Okay, next page. So this is just a, about your research plan, and Darren, you can click all the way through here. Um, it's, often, it's obviously important, but we are not supposed to score your research plan as the major determining factor of your overall grant score. It's not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be a complement to the rest of your application. I will admit there are people who on studies section though will say, okay, well, I really would have done it. Instead of you know looking at the people who are all pink, I really would have looked at the green people and therefore I'm gonna give them a bad score. Whenever someone does that in studies section, the rest of the room usually jumps up and down and screams at them and says, no, you can't do that. Um, but so it's just, a t I'm trying to emphasize that this of all of the pieces of your application is probably not, I don't want to say least important, but it kind of is. Make sure that there's no fatal flaws though. If there's a fatal conceptual flaw, like uh, you're studying diabetics, but you're not going to look at their blood glucose levels, that's a problem. Um, so, so make sure that it's conceptually sound, um, no fatal conceptual flaws. But, but again, just make sure that it's doable, that it's compelling. And the other thing, too, is to make sure that it you know, meets your professional goals, it meets your career objectives, 
And then it also is going to really enhance the type of skills that you currently have. So you're coming to this, you have a background, a cadre of skills that you've already learned, but now this new proposal, you're going to learn a new skill. So tell us how this research plan is going to actually be able to show us this new skill that you're about to learn. Okay, next one. And Darren, you can click through this too, all the way through. Oops, I'm doing it my fast. If you have the ability, I'm going to hit the bottom point, to load your research plan with preliminary data, oh, that looks so nice. And it's lots of really pretty pictures, little bar graphs, whatever it happens to be. It shows us that you've been working on this project. It's loaded with preliminary data. It makes us feel like the project's feasible, that you have some of the right skills or the right skills are located within the env research environment. That is absolutely amazing. If you have no preliminary data, that's a little bit harder to sell. Um, but you better tell us somewhere, well, I don't have any preliminary data because I just got to the lab or I changed my project theme and now we don't have any preliminary data. Tell us why you don't have any preliminary data if you don't. But if you do, even if it's tiny, showcase it because we love, we're typical data mongers. We love data and we love to see that there's a bunch of it in there because it tells us that you are well on your way to doing a really phenomenal project. All right, next, um, respective contributions. This is the next section within your grant application. We want to know who wrote the grant. Now, that may sound odd to you, but occasionally what we'll find is that a person has been in the grant for one week, or I'm sorry, the person has been in the lab for one week, and all of a sudden they've written this incredible grant with all this preliminary data. Now, we know that probably didn't happen. That probably is some other student's preliminary data. It's somebody else's grant that's been warmed over and now they have attached your name to it. But if it's really yours and you came up with this incredible idea that it's your brainchild, you developed it, you've got to tell us that because we, we want to know that. We want to know that this is, this is something that you're passionate about. This is all you. You wrote it. It's all about you. You wrote it. It's all exactly what you need to do for your career. Your mentor basically just said, this is brilliant and loved your idea. And you and your mentor have the best relationship ever. And so together, your mentor kind of looked at it, kind of maybe gave you a few suggestions. But basically, this is your brainchild. This is you. And, and you own it. And you tell us that in this um, section called respective contribution. Okay, next. Um, the selection of your sponsor and institution. This is another page that you write for us. You tell us, um, Darren, you can click through these two as well. So you tell us why are you, for example, why are you at Drexel? Why did you choose your mentor? What sort of skills are you bringing to Drexel that, that you think you're bringing to Drexel, but you're also bringing to this project? And it was because you have all of this background, all of this amazing ideas, you chose this sponsor, and now you are this incredible team, you and the sponsor at this institution, and it's the best way to be able to go through and do all of this amazing science that you're proposing. So this is what you tell us in this sort of why you, why now, why this sponsor. Um, and you can see there's a lot of repetitiveness in, in this grant application, and you want to make sure that it's repetitive. You don't want to all of a sudden say, oh, well, I did this or whatever, but make sure that you tell us all about why this is the perfect time and the perfect place for you, the sponsor, to make this research happen. Okay, next. Um, other important suggestions. You might want to outline your career objectives, especially if you're trying, if you're thinking about the fact that this is a K award and you want to then highlight, okay, not only am I going to get this K award, but this is K, getting this K award is really going to help me get my R01 or my next career grant. You also want to find somebody who has presented something similar or a comparable type of a grant application. And again, we have them probably within the college. I have them several different types, just, just so that you can kind of get a feel for what someone in your field might want to use or how they applied for their successful grant. And then also it's really important for you to talk to the program officer. Um, and that's a whole other conversation all unto itself. Um, but these are just some important other suggestions that I wanted to provide you. Darren, next one. You also have to develop a career development plan. 
this needs to, um, you, again, you can kind of click through this, Darren. It needs to talk about um, your coursework, um, how you're going to address, excuse me, different holes that in your grant, um, how you're going to identify um, the, the funding period. Um, it just, again, is basically telling us um, for you, for your career, what are you going to do in order to make you move forward in your career objectives? And that's basically what this document says. Next. We also look at training and in responsible uh, conduct of research. This is where you're going to highlight, and this is a scorable section on your grant. So you do not want to not put a lot of time and effort into this section. This should be something that you and your mentor write together, as well as I should also help you as, or any person in the um, Associate Dean of Research, we should help you with this. It should come from the institution. It should tell you, uh, tell the granting organization what you're going to be taught, how often, the duration, the frequency, who is going to be teaching you responsible codes of conduct and ethics, what the format is, is it going to be online and is it going to be Zoom, is it going to be seminars, what faculty is going to participate in the, in the education of you with respect to ethics, and, and again, that this is a scored area of your grant, so you got to make it good. It's really, really important, and I have some outstanding examples of other um, people who have put in some really beautiful training and responsible codes of conduct. Um, they have just gotten rave reviews at the study section. So this is a section that we can, I can really help you with. Um, then the next section is your sponsor, the sponsor rights. And those of you who might be sponsors who are listening to this, this is so important as well. This is where you really talk about, and Darren, you can click through there. Um, you want to talk about what research support is available for the student. You want to talk about who your previous mentees and trainees are, how successful they've been. You want to talk about um, the number of fellows and trainees that are going to be supervised during the same time that the student is being supervised. Believe it or not, we have had grants come through where there are 100 other students in the lab. And when that happens, we're like, uh, this poor student isn't going to be 101 and probably is not going to be in the best environment. So if you have a, a, a lab or an environment where you have tons of fellows and trainees, make sure that you say that you are you walk on water and that you can totally devote all of your time and attention to all of these people who are in your in your facility or who you supervise. And you've done it before with that many people and you're very successful. Um, Make sure that you tell us you have all the appropriate qualifications to make sure your student will be able to learn these amazingly new, new skills. Um, also, one of the things is that if you happen to need a co-sponsor, like for example, you don't have genetics and your student really does need it, it's really important that you have an established credibility or an interaction with that co-sponsor. Either you've published together before or you've done seminars together. Show us that you and that other co-sponsor have some sort of relationship that indicates that the two of you can work together. It's actually really important. All right, next section, and I'm almost getting done, so I know I'm, my time is running short. Letters of recommendation and candidate letters. Those of, for the students, you want to ask for three researchers to write your letters of recommendation. Um, you need to make sure that they tell, say that, and you, Darren, you can click all the way through this, that you have the capacity to be a Nobel Prize winner. You, believe it or not, you, you want those letters of recommendation. And those of you who are students who are listening, uh, nine times out of ten, you might have to write your own letter of recommendation. Um, and so you're going to have to sell yourself. You're going to hand this letter of recommendation that you want this person to write for you, but you will have already written it yourself. That happens a lot. Um, but you, you want to make sure that it is so powerful. Again, this is another place that you need to make sure that if you didn't write it, make sure that the person who wrote it, if you have the opportunity to see it, make sure that they have your name spelled correctly, that it is your name in the letter of recommendation, that they use language such as, of all of the 150 students I've ever supervised, this person is in the top 5% of all students. Make sure that this letter is so incredibly compelling that we're like, wow, this person is amazing. Um, we oftentimes, though, realize that all students are going to look for phenomenal letters of recommendation, and it would be 
cool of you to have them. So this is an area, though, it's important, um, is one that we kind of gloss over because probably we think everybody, every recommendation is going to be glowing and glossy and amazing. But if it's not, oh, then it stands out to us like, oh, my gosh, then this person must be really horrible if they didn't get a good letter of recommendation. So this is, it's an area that's sort of glossed over, but if it's a bad letter of recommendation, don't use it. We'll find somebody else. Okay, so that's just the letter of recommendation. Okay, um, then briefly towards the end here, just citizen requirements, and you guys will all get a PDF of this if you don't have it already. I just wanted to tell you um, what the citizenship requirements are. Also, um, when you're doing a budget, um, we you, these grants give you stipends. Um, these are not salaries, but they and you're not considered a government employee. Um, and also, we the, the pre-doctoral awards with respect to the stipends is one level for all individuals. And Darren, if you click the next one, um, these are additional fellowship criteria. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, the stipends that I got put in the wrong spot. The where it says stipends continued postdoctoral fellows. If you're a postdoctoral fellow, um, you can click through that. Um, you get funding based on your years of experience. And so um, that's really important that we ask for the right level of years of experience for you for your grant application. And so when you're in this place where we're looking at developing your budget, make sure that we have this information correct for you. Um, currently, the dean has encouraged us to pay people based on the NIH guidelines, which is really exciting. So um, not every place is required to do that, but you want to make sure that when you're putting your budget together that you're asking for the appropriate amount of money. So that was really fast, I know, um, but I wanted to give you an overview and we can just end it there 